Welcome to season two, episode one of the Commissaire Commentaries. I'm Marcy Weiss, and this is my co-host, Ryan Fu. We have Diane Fortini, who is a member of the USA Cycling Officials Hall of Fame. So we're very excited to have her here with us to ask Diane some questions and hear about her journey in cycling. To start off, we would like to commemorate Diane by reading her USA Cycling Hall of Fame citation. The New England Bicycle Association created the Diane Fortini Lifetime Service Award for a reason. Diane has been a gift to us all, fellow crew member, teacher, mentor, and friend. For over 25 years, Diane has supported grassroots racing and helped her fellow officials learn the ropes. Recognized as Official of the Year locally, regionally, and nationally. Diane achieved the rank of National Commissaire in 2004. She has served USA Cycling in many capacities, including the USCF Board of Trustees in 2008. With that, I will now pass it on to Marcy. I'd like to start by sharing my favorite memory of Diane. And I think this might have been close to when I first met her, but it was maybe maybe about 15 years ago. And I remember I was working registration at the Tour of America's Dairyland and mm -hmm. um, probably not even yet 18. And I remember <laughs> back after the race, spending hours just looking for a certain rider's waiver. And I was just beside myself because I wanted to make sure everything was right. And I knew who Diane was and I knew her stature. And I was like, oh God, I got to get this right for Diane. So um, I just remember searching and searching and searching through piles and piles of paper for a uh, rider waiver because I was like, <laughs> we've got to do this. Our team has got to do this. So that that is my Diane memory. And safe to say we we made it through to the other side <laughs> <laughs> the stress of that race is long gone but uh <laughs> um, I, think I remember that yeah <laughs> yeah it was quite a while ago at this point yeah. so that being said uh before we jump off into diane's intro of who she is uh ryan let's hear uh your favorite memory Okay, so before before this call, we did some prep work with Diane, and she said, I don't think I've ever met you before, but I have met you, Diane. My most vivid memory of you is seeing you cry, and that was in 2019, February at Colorado, Colorado Springs. Springs. You had received the award for, for Officials Hall of Fame, and you were, you were crying tears of joy, not <laughs> sadness, but I had heard about you. Uh, through Jeff, um, and you had worked tour of California, uh, mm -hmm. but we we've never had the opportunity to work together. But I'm glad I got the opportunity to honor you at at Colorado Springs in 2019, and and today I, I hope to learn learn some more about your legacy with cycling. So Marcy, we'll take it away with the first question. Okay, perfect. So first of all, who is Diane Fortini before cycling, and then how'd you get started in cycling? Well, I grew up in a very small town in Pembroke, Massachusetts. It's about halfway between Boston and Cape Cod, close to the coast. Um, went to a regional high school where I met my husband. He was a senior, I was a junior at the time. And um, we started dating, we've been together ever since. We've been together for 55 years and we celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary in August this year. <laughs> So wow, that's a big event we're looking forward to. But um, he's the reason I got into it because he, um, after we went to college, both went to college, came back, we got married after he graduated from um, school, and then um, eventually moved to Plymouth, where we joined the Mass Bay Road Club, did recreational riding, but Rick got into racing. And um, so we go to you know, be at the races on the weekends and everything. And I just saw that there was a need for officials. I saw some 
some injustices, writers not getting free laps when they should have, things like that. And I decided instead of complaining about it, I had to do something about it. And Tom Vinson, who was the chief, um, I mean, the district rep at that time, was also part of Mass Bay. And um, I talked to him and I said, told him I was interested in being an official. So we got into the next officials clinic that he put on and um, in 1990 got my officials license. And that first year I worked 23 races, <laughs> including the Killington stage race at the end of the year. And um, it just went from there. But I just saw that there was a need and um, it was great because I had a great understanding of the sport Mm -hmm. And I took to it right away, so um, I went, just went from there. Yeah, that's super cool. I um, will have another tick in the column, Ryan, for officials who have been dragged in by, you know, a, a spouse or partner that races and, mm -hmm. you know, on the sidelines really isn't enough for most of us. we got to be doing stuff and help, so. So, so happy that you uh, got drawn in from the edge there all those years ago. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love it. And even when he wasn't racing or we had a day off, we went to watch, <laughs> watch a race. And everybody like, would be like, why are you here? <laughs> and I, I love the sport. And, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't keep away from it. So it really became a part of our lives. You know, when Kristen came along, she would I'd drag her along. and. Um, Eventually, you know where she is. For those who don't know, my daughter is Kristen Mills, and many of you have probably worked with her at some point, but she um very proud of what she's done. So it became a family affair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I feel that one. Yeah, um, you know, I know that I know. My, my mom has worked with you quite, you know, quite a bit more than I have. One um, of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh have that have that in common for you know ending yeah. up at my races every weekend because that's that's where the family is and that's where that's right. yeah that's where everything is so how's your mom she's good um these days she does uh taxes and tax season and bike racing the rest of the year so it's you know kind of the dream um she's retired you yeah know. <laughs> okay. please give her my yeah. guess as you started officiating, um, do you feel like you ended up kind of going in a certain direction with um, like racing discipline, whether crits or road races, or or did you do track or cyclocross or mountain bike or certain positions at those races? I pretty much did road events, got into you know crits, road races, you know cross cyclocross in New England is big, but we, we don't have a, a velodrome. We don't have a track. Mm -hmm. And there's the closest to us was um, either um, Casino in New York or, or D down. Um, so I mainly just did a little bit of everything and mm -hmm. loved it all. But um, cyclocross was my favorite. And New England was very big with cross. And some of the guys that really started it all, like Paul Curley and Tom Stevens, I learned a lot from them. But um, I really do like that more. And um, doing the Killington stage race the first time, my first year, I met Joan Durdaller, and she took on a, she took me under her wing, and um, she was like a mentor to me. And I know we'll probably talk about that a bit, but she um, really introduced me to a lot, and I learned a lot. And it just the more I learned, the more I wanted to do. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you feel like you started uh, kind of judging, refereeing, leaning into one of those more than the other, or just you were there for the racing and jumped in uh, wherever needed? Um, probably judging more at first, a few um, referee jobs, but, um, you know, I had good people like Bruce Boxtall and Ken and Pace, and when I first started off, that really helped along and Bruce was such a great judge, so I learned a lot from him. And then with Kenan as a referee, learning how to, you know, be a calm and everything else. So I, again, I, even the first year I started doing a lot and then I just moved my way up each year. I moved up to the next category and 
came into our com in 2004. We understand that you've also made significant contributions in the local association level with Nebra. Tell us a little bit about what you were involved with there. Yeah, there were a few of us that started Nebra um, back in um, the LA concept came in with USA Cycling. And um, so of the group of us that were the initial sort of board of directors, they decided that I should be, you know, they asked if I would like to be the administrator. So I took on that role um, as administrator and probably did it about 12 years or so. I um, maybe it wasn't quite that long, but uh, I did every <laughs> everything. I designed the officials. I did the race calendar. I did all the upgrades, um, proving new courses. I, I did all the, you know, other work where I know a lot of the other LAs, you know, had different people doing different jobs. So, but I did that and that was another great way to be involved, um, created a lot of work, but still, um, you know, helping to teach the officials, have the clinics and um, assign officials to the races and do all the paperwork before and after. So that was, you know, another part of my life with cycling. One of the things, Diane, about Nebra, the first Nebra official that I ever met was Chris Constantino. Okay. And I met him I met him in Colorado Springs for my A clinic. And at that clinic, everybody talks about local associations. So how do you do things with assigning officials or how do you do the permits and stuff? And I just remember Chris telling me about, oh, they have this assignment tool and they have this clothing program. And I was like, how come NCNC doesn't have any of this stuff? <laughs> and so I think those were all of your contributions that Chris didn't say, but I think you had a big hand in making all of the officiating programs work really well in Nebra. And even on the Nebra webpage today, there's, there's programs about mentorship and, you know, assignment requirements and it's, et cetera. So I think those are all part of things you had a hand in. Diane, I would say a little so. bit, yeah, and I'm proud that we've had some good people that have, you know, come along, good officials that have kept the, you know, everything going, and um, yeah, I'm hoping we'll have a few more. I'd like to see more at the upper level, but um, right, yeah, I'm sure it'll it'll happen. But you know, Chris did all a lot of the technological stuff. He did, you know, computers. Right, right. And he would tell me, I'm I'm a computer geek. I got to do this. I'm a nerd. So. <laughs> And I'm not. <laughs> yeah, so I always yeah. had to call it, Chris, help. I need help. <laughs> but um, yeah, we tried. We did, you know, did what we could to help out and make, you know, make things work. And um, have, Nebra had a good program, had a lot of good support with that. So one follow up question is outside of all of officiating and working as a local administrator, did you have anything that you did outside of cycling or? Was most of your life 100% cycling? It was pretty much 100% cycling. Wow. Got it. Got it. <laughs> yeah. No, I did some needlework and stuff like that, but now I can't do any of that stuff now anymore. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, that took up between Nebra, all the work with that. Um, and then if I had to, you know, officiate races and everything, it was pretty much 100% cycling. It, yeah, it was 100%. Wow. Wow, yeah, because my husband great. still raced. He rode and raced, so it was just, it was what we did. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Looking back to your past races where you worked, what event stood out to you? Not because it was like the Tour of California, but maybe some unique lessons or experiences they offered you. Um, gosh, it's so hard because I worked so many events, so many different events, and every one had its own unique um, style and, and way of doing things. But the one that really stood out to me was the Chris Thader Memorial in uh, Binghamton, New York. And they were the complete package. They had from the great organizer and um, they just, everything was set up so well and communication to everyone involved was great between their first aid set up and um, Joe Sailing was their announcer 
and they communicated with everybody ahead of time. And so everybody knew what was happening by the time the race came. And so it made my, I was the chief referee there for I don't know how many years, um, working with my crew, it was so easy to communicate to them because I had this great staff there, um, you know, their marshals, the police, everyone was so well organized. And we even had a great uh, plan and they asked me, like, what do you do if there's a crash? Well, I said, there's a whole different few scenarios that go along with that. Do you have, whether you're gonna shut the race down, do you just leave it, you know, let the riders run around and, uh, you know, run around. But if we have to- Neutralize you know, or- Yeah, just there's several or, different yeah. scenarios. And so I wrote a few things up for them and they passed that on to their staff. So all I had to do was say in the radio, okay, the road shut down, we have a crash. They knew exactly what they needed to do. Or if I mentioned one thing, knew what I knew what I was going to do. So everyone was on the same page. And it was a great example to use um, passing forward to when I taught um, clinics myself, the officials, new officials. And I used that for an example. And I printed out certain things. I handed out to them say, okay, this is what we use there for, you know, safety purposes and how we organize with the first aid staff and, um, or just communications with the first responders, the police, everybody. And it was just um, great that I could, you know, use that every time I went and did an event, I always had that race in the back of my mind. And it was just, it was great to have that, see it in place, the stuff you wanted to have happen. And um, yeah, it worked so well, but in the, they were they were great. They were, it was a great race. What would you say is your most favorite event outside of the New England area or North Eastern area? We had to travel <laughs> far away oh, and why? Um, I don't know if I really have a favorite. They're all so good. I mean, I used to, I worked in Nature Valley, which is now the North Star, or it was the North Star Grand Prix for a while. That was, again, another very well-organized race great racing. I enjoyed working that. Um, I did enjoy working tour of California. <laughs> Jeff probably has some few stories he could tell you about he and I working together the first year. And um, but my favorite, hmm, I'll tell you some of the collegiate nationals I did a few times and they were great in Kansas City, mm -hmm. um, up in Fort Collins in Colorado. Yeah, this, there's too many for me to narrow down as, as my favorite, really. Sorry. Because, <laughs> I mean, I just have so many reasons for, for so many different races. I can't really pinpoint one. So. I think, I think Diane, you know, the, you know, our mantra safe, fair, and, and fun. I think you want to be fair uh, to all the races. So you yeah. can't have a favorite. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Diane, you had mentioned about uh, a Joan Dura dollar, also known as Mama. Mama Joan. <laughs> and I just have a brief short story as well. I, I met her at Tour of California one year, and she was with Fred and Hilda Patton. And by that time, she she had already retired, and she was taking care of their their son. And I thought I thought she was uh their grandma uh but but i didn't know i didn't know i didn't know baba at that time as one of their great officials and and she's also a member of the hall of fame uh, tell me about some other mentors in in your officiating career and how they how they really influenced you or taught you something really important that you carried through your officiating career well, I, I mentioned Joan was probably my biggest mentor. I mean, she really taught me that how to be tough. You can still, you know, be tough, but get the job done and, and be friendly and all that. Um, and Bruce and Kennan, Charlie Smith was another one, local officials um, that when I first started off. Um, Dave Miller, of course, big guy. Worked with him quite often, really miss him. 
but you know he was just always staying relaxed and everything and um and details was another another one that um details always make sure you know all the details bill lambert i worked with him a couple of times and he was just focusing on the racing he says let them race just making sure you understood what was going on in the race and um and respecting the rides and what they had you know they were doing i'm trying to think who else what i did say this <laughs> um yeah, Bruce Boxall taught me a lot about scoring, as did Judy Miller. Marilyn Allen was another one that I learned a lot from a lot of the stage races toward Georgia. Yeah. Actually, Chuck Bodge, I learned a lot from him. <laughs> yeah, daily from the motors and how the motors worked out on the course and everything. What advice would you give to, to officials who aspire to one day be recognized? What sort of qualities or attributes? Do you think they would need to have to be able to be on that hall of fame um they really need to love the sport and um for somebody to make sure they do their homework before they go to an event um talking with everybody involved to ensure that it is going to be a safe environment it's going to be fair for everybody um communicate good communication with not only the staff but your your um officials as well be open to communication be open to listening to riders and team managers and everything too a lot of them will come up and everybody thinks they got a big beef they just want to be heard and give them give them that courtesy to be heard yeah don't turn people away and and don't don't get yourself locked into one position all the time you know, try to do a little bit of everything, even if it's, if you like being the chief, don't always just be the chief, let somebody else be the chief and just learn from, you know, let them learn from you. Um, also, you know, trust your officials, don't try to do every job yourself, delegate. And like I said, that's where good communication comes into play. I'm curious to hear more. You talked about one of your mentors help, helping you kind of learn how to be tough. And um, I would say that's a lesson that I have, well, I'm, you know, working on learning. I'm not going to pretend I'm a certain direction there yet. But can you tell us what that's meant to you and what, what that meant to you at the time and what that means to you now? Yeah, and I don't mean talk like a bully or anything, but don't be a pushover. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I am, for the most part, very quiet and shy. And to even do this job in the first place was, was hard for me because I didn't think I could stand up and do it. And um, she just kind of taught me, you know, you you know what you're doing. You get out there and you tell them this is what's, what, it, what it is and don't let anybody tell you, you know, this is the way it should be. Just, you know stand up for yourself and just that's it about being tough because it's easier easy for somebody who doesn't know you know all the um the facts as it comes to a race you know and saying no that's not the right call or you did it wrong or stuff like that and if they don't know everything and don't know all the facts and the details and everything you know they have no business saying anything so you just got to say sorry this is the way it is and you just got to stand up for yourself And did you ever have to recover from making a bad decision? And in that moment, maybe you had to share your toughness or maybe a moment of vulnerability. Um, do you recall any examples where maybe the call wasn't right and then you had to recover from it somehow? You know, no. No. <laughs> No, good, an I, good I, answer, I, Diane. Good answer. No, I truly, good you answer. know, I think my uh, any decision I made was right. Yeah. Maybe yeah. somebody yeah. else didn't think it was, but again, maybe they don't know all the facts or or whatever. But I firmly believe that I always, you know, that I made the right decision. Yeah. Again, yeah. somebody else may not agree with it, and it, you know, that's not to say I didn't have to make some tough decisions disqualifications or things like that but um again you got to stand up to it it's not always easy but um 
I, I always look back on things and I, yeah, I, there wasn't anything I regret, any decision that I regret. And then when it comes to, to folks who you've mentored, what do you, uh, what are some of the memorable times that you've taught others in your area? So I know you talked about the race where you kind of got to work with the entire staff of both officials and race organizers and volunteers to really elevate their sense of, you know, how to run a bike race from, from their perspective. How, how did that happen in other places, other times, other people? Well, the one thing it, it's hard when you start traveling and working races outside your area, you find that there are a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that are done in New England might not be the same somewhere else because mm -hmm. racing I found is different everywhere because of numbers and the type of racing and everything. Mm -hmm. So you have to, when you go somewhere and have a crew of people you, you've never worked with before, mm -hmm. the idea is to not come in and change them, change the way they're they're doing things just because it might not be the way I would do it. You just got to find that fine line where you can, everything can mesh together nicely. You know, you just say, this is what I want to have done. If I'm the chief referee, this is what I'd like to see. And as long as they give me the information, however they they do it and can get me the, the correct information, I'm satisfied. But that comes down with good communication. Mm -hmm. Do we all score the same way? Do we all, you know, do the same thing? You know, no, we don't. And, um, you know, try to, when I try to, work with other officials it's like you do things do things the way you would normally do it that's comfortable for you you know like when we do cross some of us score horizontally some do die you know vertically and some people some people say that's not right no there's no right or wrong if you do it the way you're comfortable with if it's you know i would say as long as i can read it if i have to interpret your paper but just give me the, as long as you give me the correct information, however you get it, and and working with others, it's just letting, not trying to make them do things the way I want it done. Just as long as I just ask them to give me this particular information, and um, you know, I I always hope if I'm on a crew, if I'm I'm so used to being the chief referee. I'm <laughs> sorry, but um, you know, if I'm a judge or a com, you know. I would hope I get the same kind of treatment. And so far, I pretty much do. Everybody I find has pretty been pretty easy to work with. Yeah, for sure. That that shared communication of the, you know, shared outcomes and just also, you know, also if you are coming from somewhere else or someone else is coming in to your area to just have that communication so that everyone can be on the same page and work toward right. the same goal is that's right. We're all working for the same per you know, the same goal. So Marcy's question about anybody that you've mentored that was memorable. Maybe you can talk about Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have? <laughs> uh, did, so, I I mean, I would did, work with her above and beyond anybody else, to be honest with you. Yeah. And she might not say the same thing about me. I don't know. But um, and it's only because she knows what I want as far as information and how I work a race and everything. And I know I can rely on her to give me the information. And I've always found her, you know, I've always had to put it aside. I'd never let the fact that she was my daughter get in the way. She, as far as I was concerned, if I was the chief ref and she was on my crew, she was no different than anybody else. And, um, you know, but she, it was always easy working with her because she knew what I wanted. She's heard, heard me enough times talking about, you know, what I expected a race and kind of information I want and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. and I'm just pretty happy that she took a lot of what she learned from me, you know, with her when she works. So she started um, officiating as a, very young, right? But, well, she was like 15. <laughs> 15, yeah. Yeah, she was pretty young. Yeah, I think starting as a very young official, there's a aspect of that toughness that I think you, you've you mentioned, mm -hmm. where, you know, they people see a kid as an official in a blue shirt, and do they have the authority yet? Um, 
but I think that that in order for them to be able to continue like how Kristen is, I think she has had to adapt some of the traits that you've mentioned yeah. about. Yeah, she the, has the confidence, you know, yep. you have to show the confidence, but you have to do it not in a cocky way. And mm -hmm. and you have to act, act like an adult. So they're not treating you like yeah. a kid. Or that. You got to look, you got to be professional at what you're doing. And if you can show that, you know, I've worked with enough young kids, I don't want to say kids young. Well, yeah, some of them are kids it, that don't always do that. They think, you know, they're good officials and, and it doesn't come across. They just haven't learned that bit of professionalism that they need to have. Um, but for the most part, there's been a lot that have. If I could backtrack onto one thing in Kristen, yeah. one thing we never did with her when she was young was put her in a position of authority right away. Because I would, first yeah. of all, I wouldn't want to do that to a young person because you can be approached sometimes pretty aggressively by some people if they think, you know, you haven't put them in the right order in the finish or whatever. So um, wouldn't expect somebody very young to have to handle that and come back with an answer and stuff. So I never really, she never was really in a chief position until she got a little bit older. Yeah, probably more closer to 18, I would think, but that I, just for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Dan, do you see a third generation, a third 14 <laughs> generation of officials? I, I don't, well, I shouldn't <laughs> say no, I don't think so. I mean, okay. she enjoys, she enjoys riding. Um, yeah, my granddaughter. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, who knows? I don't know. Maybe she's, we, Kristen has used her several times to ring the bell or old lap guides or things like that or at certain races, training races and things. But um, whether she ever got into it, you know, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, so. we, we recently had a new officials clinic. Uh, here in in Northern California, and they and the youngest was I think uh, twelve years old. Uh, they just oh, wow. they, yeah, they just took the class, but they but I think according to Bonnie that the, there's a minimum age for a young official. I think it's sixteen or something. Yeah. So they 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 can just be sort of official trainees or junior officials, they, but they they can't get yeah. licensed. One of the challenges with younger officials is. You know they have to see fun have to see fun in it and what aspect of fun do you see in officiating that attributed to your longevity because you had to have some essence of fun in order to keep doing it for over a quarter of a century so what do you have any maybe moments of fun that really stood out to you in your in your officiating um <laughs> The fun part probably wasn't while the races were actually going on. It was usually <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> like that. But, yeah. you know, it, it's great watching. I get enjoyment watching a race develop. And when you see somebody working so hard and they win the race, you know, it's joyful. Um, something that's worked so hard for something, you know, that's if you want to call that fun too. But I, you know, I love that kind of thing. Um, we had a, a a great announcer here in New England, um, Dick Ring, who um, just recently passed away, unfortunately. But he he made the races fun. He would come up with these stories while he was announcing that were just so funny. Like I think he had me swim in the um, the English Channel one time. I don't know. I forget how the thing. But I mean, it was everybody had a story, and um, that he would work into the race, and so that sort of made things fun. But um, I think just enjoying the race and seeing what happens, seeing a good race happen. Of course, sometimes things don't always go really well. But um, um, but afterwards, with if you have, a, I found it like a big family and everybody got along great, and you share stories. That's a, a good learning tool too, with sharing stories. A lot of people can learn from some of the stories we've all had, but. Um, yeah, I, I I just enjoy being around everything. Okay, you, you mentioned the best the best part of fun is usually not during the race, but after the race. <laughs> um, we'll we'll share we'll share a picture uh, later. Oh, dear, but you, there's this picture of you, Kristen, and another official in wearing uh, mouse ears. 
Um, I think they're Mickey Mouse ears or something. Can you share what the, the, three, the, what's the story mice. behind? Yeah, the three blind mice. <laughs> what's the story behind that? Well, it was it was a cross race, and it was Halloween, and a lot of people had a tendency to dress up and everything at the races on Halloween. Um, not while they raced, but just hanging around. So we thought it would be fun. Uh, Kristen and this other and the other official was Kelly Perdonis, and um, I was the chief referee, Kristen was chief judge, and Kelly was the judge. And we decided when we go give their instructions on the line, we would dress up as the three blind mice and say, okay, I'm the chief referee, and here are my two judges, and here we have the dark glasses on. And we had canes as well. And <laughs> it's like, okay, the three blind mice are judging this race. This ought to be good. It was just, of course, we didn't dress like that through the race, but we just started off that way, and it was just just a little little prank on everybody so but it, it was fun to do yeah that's super fun <laughs> yeah. i always uh wish i had better ideas for the halloween cross races in our parts i think i've yeah. worn uh this past year i wore like a uh, the old zebra stripes um, referee yeah. shirt. And oh, I was like, I'm just, yeah. I'm just a referee. <laughs> I was in uniform, but out of uniform, you know. Yeah, very good. <laughs> so times have times have changed a lot since officials. I I think I think officials at one point in time wore zebra stripes, right, Diane? Or were they you always wearing the blue yep. shirt? Uh, no, I always we had the blue shirts and okay. black and pants. No, gray. We started with gray and then it moved to khaki. I was, I think I just missed out on the zebra stripes. Okay. <laughs> what have you seen change in terms of cycling, officiating from when you first started to when, when you retired or what you're seeing today in terms of the landscape of cycling and officiating? Well, I've been out of it for nine years now. It's been that long um, because I became ill in um, 2015 and I had to stop officiating and um, having, I have an autoimmune condition that just affects me enough so I had to stop everything. But um, so to be honest, I kind of lost track of everything and um, I've gone to a couple of races to watch. but. Uh, what I saw changing when I, before I, I retired, um, which I was very happy with, and, and it was for a few years while I was touring, was how cross, how big cyclocross got. It um, was, went from nationals being one day, everything was in <laughs> one day, <laughs> to, was it six days now, I think, for, at least the last time we did across national six days and being my favorite discipline i just love the fact that it has grown so much um but one of the other changes I, that sort of happened and i don't know if it's with just here if it's the rest of the country or whatever was it seemed like there was a decline of the clubs and it became a lot of club members went to teams as opposed to being in a club and they raced that way and i always felt that the club you know, even if it, if it had like a bike shop as the, the nucleus of everything and the clubs was such a great way for riders to, to get together, to train together, you know, train rides. I thought it helped with junior development, um, new riders coming in, because I thought riders, the experienced riders were great references for any new rider coming in. And actually when people ask me now, you know, how do I get involved? I'm saying, well, do you have a local bike shop? There's local clubs you could find out about. But times have changed so much. I don't think that's the case anymore. And then we saw, especially here, the clubs sort of had all these teams would branch out of the clubs and the clubs sort of disappeared in some cases. And that hurt as far as I think putting on races and everything else, because a team of a five, six guys or girls it's harder for them to put an event on than it is for an entire club. So, you know, I'd love to see, I mean, and again, I don't know what the landscape is now as far as clubs and even, even in New England, I, I kind of lost track of that. Um, 
masters became a big thing. It seemed like all the guys that had been racing and got older now was in, all in the masters. So you had the difference between the experienced masters and the new ones, guys that came in, whether they came from, um, you know, had gone to the gym, you know, have a new awareness of fitness and got, you know, did around here, we have a lot of charity rides, like the Pan Mass Challenge is a huge um, event here. And people would do that and come here, you know, ask me about getting into racing from because they did well in the charity ride and have to try to explain the difference. And um, so I think, you know, if you can, first thing I would always say to them was find a, find a club to join. Um, refer to USA Cycling, go on the USA Cycling website. Um, I said, riders, are you going to be your best references? I said, learn a little bit about the sport. I always get frustrated with a lot of new riders coming in, racers, do not know the history of the sport or anything about it or the people involved. And it's just come in, do their race and go home and not always know all of, you know, the fine um, aspects of, of racing. But um, again, I don't know how things have changed, if they've changed any more since I've been out of it. But, um, you know, and I don't know, technology technology's probably changed. The chips were just starting to come into play when, when I was working. I've only had experience with chips once, but that was in a different type of event. It was in Bermuda um, and um, working on what's the International Island Games, which is a whole different topic and something I really <laughs> love but it um I mean it, it's a great was a great part of my career even though it wasn't a USAC event well since you mentioned Bermuda I did see uh, somewhere your involvement with with Bermuda was it a cycling center right Bermuda yeah. cycling center or was it Bermuda, the actual tropical island in the oh, it is the island. It is the island, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. They had the, the Bermuda Grand Prix every year. Oh, um, and it was when all the pro riders, the pro teams would go there and race. It was in it was in September. It was back before the calendar all changed and everything. And it's when they weren't racing back then. And a lot of them would go there and do this do this race. Um it was it was um like a few days, five days of racing, I guess it was, if I remember correctly. Um, Joan used to work it every year, and one year she couldn't do it, and they asked me to replace her. Fred and Hildy would do the timing. Um, and so I went over, and I said, sure, I'll go over. And, well, I was the only official. They didn't have officials, um, and it wasn't part of USA Cycling or anything. That It actually wasn't um, a, a sanctioned event with any governing body or anything. And it, um, we just would make it work and make this race. And there was really no rules. They had sort of a technical guide, but so I worked uh -oh. the race. I wound up working it many years. And over those years, I said to them, you guys really should develop rules. And um, they eventually, um, their program, they have a big junior program there and they do great. And they, um, they developed rules. They became part of, uh, they joined the UCI. And um, so I helped them develop rules. Most of their rules that were, um, they would use USA, USCF for, for what was then US, USCF um, as their guidelines. And a couple of the guys that I worked with there actually raced over here a few times they have either family here in uh, new england and stuff so that's how i kind of met them and they eventually developed their own rules became sanctioned they joined the uci and um then a few years went by so when we had the grand prix the race um landscape changed because the pros were now having other ra pro races in that time of year so they didn't go there but Bermuda still on their own had a really great program and they still had their races and everything um, that kept building up so the next thing was they were going to be hosting the International Island Games which is games for islands who have a population of un under 200,000 
So it's like the Isle of Man, and of course Bermuda is one of them, and uh, Gibraltar, and all these islands. A lot of them were in the Baltic areas and everything. And they wanted me to to work it. And they said, but we, you know, I said, you guys probably need officials. So we did an officials program. I went over and I taught them how to be officials. We had a whole group of um, people who became officials. So Bermuda has an active program and they have officials and um, they do mountain cross and uh, road events over there. And when those island games came, I worked it and it was working with their whole staff, pretty much developing how cycling should be, something they hadn't ha really had. And the ones from the Bermudians would tell me that every time they went to any of these, they felt like there was this, um, the host nation was just favored, who they have, whoever they had working that event, it favored their athletes and everybody else didn't do so well so by talking you know with them and working with the island um, group their uh, organization we came up with a set of rules and various things and that they had to be licensed and um, had uci licenses and all this thing so that went off great and it just had a whole host of things to deal with that i had never dealt before because i get all these people these pasty white people who don't see the sun very often racing in bermuda in 90 degree heat and humidity and it was so you had to modify rules like allow i allowed water hand ups in the time trial and things because you didn't want to make it a death march for everybody it was <laughs> you had to kind of adapt to who you were dealing with it was um it was so interesting and i loved it it was a great great event but i was i was really happy to have helped them develop the program they have and um yeah so they they have a very established program now and great racing over there and i haven't been back for a while since i since i got ill so how long were you involved with bermudan cycling <laughs> I want to say I did it seven years in a row. Seven years in a row. Wow. Yeah. That's that's super a super cool legacy. That's uh that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. about that. Yeah, it's fun. And I bump into I see them now and then, and they actually have riders now who are on professional teams in Europe. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's like this you know that there's a little part of me that helped out. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 So one of the questions I had for you, Diane, is there a rule named after you? Because if you look at the USA cycling rule, there's a lot of history where, oh, that rule was from that person or that rule is that from person. But you already answered the question from uh, for me because, you know, about this time trial rule with the feeding. So you definitely have a legacy there in Bermuda. With, there's probably a lot of Diane Fortini rules. Well, that was just for that one thing, the island games, because there was no way I was going to let these people. And it was, but it was one of those things. And because one of the guys said, you're letting them feed. And I said, I'm allowing hand ups and it's a particular area. And there'll be somebody monitoring, but I said, it, it can happen to anybody. And they, and they have to stop and take, it was one of those that couldn't be a hand up. They had to stop and get a bottle if they needed it. But it was one of those, the rule applied to everybody. It was fair because everybody had the same opportunity. And if someone had to stop and put their foot down to get a bottle, they weren't gaining any advantage by doing that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to make adjustments depending on the, the situation. Uh, you know, it happened once in collegiate nationals, we had to alter one of the road courses because it was underwater and they the road they used was hard packed dirt. And somebody had come along the night before with a gravely or something, and it turned up all the stones. And at the time, there was only one support vehicle. And so we allowed um, me in discussion with the um, national events manager and everything to allow um, staff to go on that course with wheels if they had to, because there was only one support vehicle and only so many wheels. And of course, collegiate racing they don't have a lot of equipment either. Right. And so we allowed them to be able to get a wheel if they needed it on that stretch or stretch of road. But again, it applied to everybody. Um, there was nobody gaining any advantage by it. And, it. and it turned out it almost didn't matter because 
it was it was awful. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those things. Had we had more support, it probably would have helped a little bit. But you know, Diane, remember when I asked you earlier? Do you have a favorite event? So I think and, you don't have a favorite event in USA, but for Bermuda, you have a favorite event. No, there, but you so. know what? Since you came, I thought of one of my favorite events since we okay. talked. Okay. I did the Paralympics in Atlanta oh. in 96. Probably the my, my most favorite thing I've ever really done. Um, learned a lot from that. And it, it was it was great. That was, um, and the first time I, I ever had to work a track event. <laughs> Not knowing <laughs> what I was doing, but it all I pulled it off. The chief referee, uh, the president was, you know, from another country, and we didn't tell him that I had never worked a track event. <laughs> I pulled it did off. You have, did you have to cram uh, the rule book? You had to really study the rule book hard for, for yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. But the rest of it was, yeah, it was it was a great event. It was a great event. It, and actually, it was, that one was fun in the sense that uh, out on the road, um, the I think it was the chief ref, the chief of police for the town um, was driving the car and um, of COM 2, of COM 1. And I must have been, in, I was in COM 2. And I kept saying, talking about one of the riders is, He's put the hammer down. He's put the hammer down. And, well, my New England accent, my Boston accent, he didn't understand anything I was saying. But <laughs> when the race was all done, he just came up and says, what the hell is a hammer? <laughs> so he had to explain it to him. I'm putting the hammer down, it's an expression. But he. Uh, That's funny. There were a couple of things in the car that I had been saying over the radio that he was just... He just didn't understand me at all. So some, sometimes there's little fun things like that. I have a follow-up question on the um, Paralympics, Atlanta Paralympics, right? Yeah. Um, recently in August, I worked a master championship and it also included Paralympics disciplines. Okay. Bonnie was helping me with bike measurements for uh -huh. Paris cyclists. And you know, each one has their own type of bikes and measurements. Did did you have to do any of that at Atlanta we, at that time, or were there rules all, around that? There were, but not like they are now. I I couldn't get all. I am so happy to see how much it's changed. The, yeah. the number of um, countries now that are involved, and how many athletes. When I see it on the coverage on television, it's just it's great to see how. How much it's evolved since um, since I worked it, but we no, we didn't have all that. Oh, okay. No, well, that's definitely changed. Uh, definitely changed the number definitely. of the types of events and everything. The um, the uh, oh shoot, I forget the word. The different categories, um, mm -hmm. the breakdown of the different the various levels of um, disabilities and everything. Um, it's so many more. Or now, you know, they've broken that down so many now. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Before we get to conclusion, is there any other stories you'd like to share with us? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. No? Okay. What are the, what'd you say? <laughs> oh, the toilet paper. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. Okay. My husband got it. from the other room. Okay. Poor California. Okay. <laughs> One of the road races. Um, I had, you know how sometimes they put a passenger in your car to a sponsor or somebody? Well, there was one in my back seat. And um there was one harrowing section we had gone through in the downhill, and my driver was just going for it because we had got a call to try to catch up to the front of the race so we're on this descent and i after the race was over and we we're having our meeting and everything the driver cleans out the car takes care of everything and we came out and the driver said i think your passenger had a little problem during the race well 
So the next day as they're lining all the cars up and everything before the next stage, I go get in my car. Bonnie and I were talking and I go get in the car and um, I believe it was Wayne Pomario. I don't like to drop names out there, but if anybody knows Wayne Pomario, they know yeah. what he's like. So there was a sign hung around the neck, the rest, the headrest of the front seat and with a sign in the back about something about flushing. Don't, do not flush or whatever. And on the passenger seat was a roll of toilet paper and a couple of magazines <laughs> <laughs> in case I had a passenger that day. But it was funny. It was all caught me by surprise. I went to get in the car and I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> but the prankster. So. Um. I think I think the lesson learned from that experience, Diane, is always give reassurance to your passenger that if they need to go or if they need to use the facilities, just speak up. Because, uh, we don't want accidents. Um, that was that yeah. was pretty funny. I had I had no clue that anything had happened, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's definitely a fun race in Tour of California. Um, it was good. I worked it once as a judge with Jeff. He drove our car. So, oh, yeah, it was fun. Any fun stories of Jeff? I'm sure there's always fun stories of Jeff. <laughs> no. Um, he kind of made me car sick a little bit on the way we were descending. <laughs> Going down one of the descents, I had to tell him to pull over for a minute. <laughs> yeah. I said, just kind of tone it down a little. But, you know. No, he was, yeah, he was yeah. good. He, he was fun to work with. Yeah. He he can sometimes take things a little bit too seriously. <laughs> He's just trying to catch up. And so that's why he. That's why, uh, yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Diane, as we wrap up the podcast, what type of legacy do you wish to leave behind? And how would you like our fellow officials to remember you by? Well, I just hope they felt that I was a fair, a fair official who just made sure that the the I had a safe race for the riders, and we did everything possible to make sure it was a safe, safe race, and and made sure it was fair for everybody. I didn't, um, you know, I always took the time to listen to anybody that wanted to talk to me, and. Um, you know, the big thing is, you know, don't make, you're not the center of attention. It's about the riders. It's not a right about the officials. You know, a lot of officials that think they're there to be the center of attention, and it's not. I was always taught that if you went home and nobody knew you had been working that race, then you did a good job. <laughs> so, you know, be honest and fair and um, reliable. Um do your work to make sure you you know you know everything that's going to be happening. And anything you're most proud of in your contribution <laughs> to cycling, and officiating, uh, local, national levels, even international in Bermuda. Yeah, but, no, I guess. Um, well, I think the one thing I'm most proud of is Kristen, but um, other than what I I've done. <laughs> Um, no, that I, you know, that I always, I liked what I did, I loved what I did, and I always felt that I did keep it a fair and safe environment, and, um, you know, part of the job is you can go out and, and do all that, and still be a part of the racing without actually racing, and get out there and be in part, you know, see all the aspects come together, all your hard work come together without actually racing. It's a, it's a great way to be a part of the sport. You know, it's being involved in a, a whole different way. So, um, you know, do, and do enjoy it. For somebody that wants to come into it, you know, I know there are people that, you know, don't know what to expect. They think they might like it. You know, let's go see a race. See if somebody will let you shadow somebody. Walk around with them and they can see different aspects, what judging is like, what refereeing is like, and uh, being in the pit. There's so many different aspects of cycling. So, you know, just give back. <laughs> you mentioned about giving back. When I read your Hall of Fame announcement, there's a Diane Fortini Award 
that really speaks to to you, Diane, that you're the essence of giving back, that they honored you to, to represent and, and remember that. So thank you. Thank you, Diane, for all of your contributions, support, and love for the sport of cycling. One of the things about legacy that you mentioned, Kristen, and I asked her, I said, is there any question you want to ask your mom? Okay. Uh, and, <laughs> and she did she didn't have anything except she wanted to just wish you a happy 50th wedding anniversary mm -hmm. and that you will be celebrating this at the upcoming Disney World trip. So congratulations right. on that. No, thank you. We want to sincerely thank you, Diane, for again your many years of service and contributions to the sport of cycling and Thank you so much for sharing your wonderful stories with us today. And I'm glad that I got to know you more uh, from back in 2019. Thank you again, Dan. We really appreciate it. Thank you. For our listeners, if you have any ideas or suggestions or would like to be a guest on the Commissaire Commentaries, please send them our way to usac.officials.podcast at gmail.com. Or we created a new Gmail address, commissaire.commentaries at gmail.com. Thank you again for listening to the second season of episode one. We will see you again in our next episode. Thank you. Hey, Diane. I was uh, happy to hear that we're doing a podcast about you. Uh, I had so much fun in my 11 years uh, with USA Cycling, uh, being at races where you were for a variety of reasons. And I uh, just thought I'd say it, it's great to see you profiled here because you're one of the best. Um, I always tell, uh, whenever I teach classes, especially about chief referees, I always mention that what we expect of a chief referee is a series of traits almost impossible to find in a single human being. Very few people um, pull that off um, with perfection like you do. I mean, you have to be detail oriented. You also have to be a people person. You have to be able to make a hard decision. Um, you have to know how to do it. Um, you have to be firm, but not a bully. Um, there's so many things that go go into it. And of course, the planning and, and the preparation and, and being a team leader and motivating your crew and um, every single thing that makes a good chief referee, you are the epitome of. And it's, uh, it's just awesome to see all of your successes. I was happy to, to be there when you were inducted in the Hall of Fame. And I uh, can't think of too many people that you know would deserve it more. Um, basically you're, you're the kind of person my dog thinks I am. And, um, uh, I've just, just been an honor to, to have been able to work with you for this many years. I probably spent more time eating dinner out with, with you at races, uh, cause probably the most of the time we were together, I was there as staff and not really on the crew. Although in the last you know, five or six years, we've done some cyclocross together. Um, I think one of the things that, that struck me the most um, very early in my tenure at USA Cycling, um, probably was in the first couple of years, I think Gerard was still there. I know we were still in the old building. Um, you called me, I think, from Nature Valley, and you told me that you had just screwed up. And gotten into some trouble over a rule interpretation and were surrounded by had just been surrounded by managers. I'm sure at the end of the day they walked away thanking you because you're so good at that part of it that even if you disqualify a rider, they're going to say thank you as they walk away. But I was blown away by the fact that it was such a rare thing for anyone to come right out and say, hey, I just screwed something up. And I immediately when I heard that what went through my head was, oh, yeah, this official is on my A-list right now. And um, 
and made sure to uh, to follow through on that because that's just a rare trait. Usually, it's the opposite. I mean, I've seen lots of officials who try to blame somebody else or pretend they weren't there when something happened on their watch. Um, but it was just really rare, and it was just a, a beautiful moment for me. It made me really happy to to have the position I held at, at USA Cycling. Uh, so that was one of my uh, one of my my biggest memories of you. But uh, every time I've ever worked with you, it's just been uh, an awesome experience. And uh, really, you you are the the consummate chief official who manages to blend a thousand things that no single human being should should even have to be able to do and you do it just uh, incredibly well so um it's been a pleasure i'm sorry i don't get to see you too much uh, the last few times i've seen you you've just been a spectator at races that i happen to be at but hopefully we'll get to see each other uh, in the future although i don't get to many races these days so i know that you still will All right, Sean. That's it, or I think so. I can't. You want to talk about being fourteenied, or no? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We still have time to do that. I know it's forgetting something. <laughs> Tell us about what's that term you coined? Okay, well, one of the other things that I I learned uh, very early uh, in my tenure, in fact, the first couple of weeks, um, was that USA Cycling had gone without a technical director for at least three years if if not longer and in that time frame the officials program had pretty much gone to dust and part of that was that there were certain people who probably in fact definitely had been on a track where they should have been international commissaries if that was their goal um and unfortunately because of the uh archaic age limitations that the UCI still enforces. Uh, there were people that got aged out in that process. And uh, you were one of the people that uh, that happened to fairly early on. And basically we developed a new word for that because you weren't the last person that that happened to. And it still happens. Um, and it happened fairly recently to another U.S. official that ran out of time and COVID didn't help that situation either. But uh, so, yeah, when, when we say that somebody got 14, it means that the, their pathway, uh, their upward mobility was was cut off because of something they had no control over, usually political. And uh, so that was the other thing I learned very early on. And, and uh, I can't remember who actually told me that first it was someone on the technical commission that yeah we don't want to see so and so get 14 eat and we all knew exactly what they meant when they said that so yeah that was the other thing i wanted to mention okay slight pause um diane we're, we are at, at the hour mark oh, i really? felt like i felt like <laughs> The conversation was just getting started, Diane. Uh, <laughs> Did you hear my voice? Sorry, my voice. Oh, like, yeah, no, you right. sound terrible. Right. Your, your voice is fine. Um, yeah, you had me crying in the beginning, Ryan. Thank you very oh. much. <laughs> uh, I get. I'm an emotional person. I get emotional easy. That's that's, that's good. That's very authentic. <laughs>